Good morning. Yeah, after Tee's brilliant introduction of linear colliders, uh, I'll, I'll go through some specific issues at the compact linear collider and as the title of the talk suggests, I'll, I'll go through some of the synergies with circular machines where, where one could establish a, a meaningful collaboration between the projects. So the compact linear collider, I guess you all know, um, it is a scheme that, an acceleration scheme that was envisaged to reach the multi-TEV scale. And that, that is still the defining uh, feature of the click technology and it gives it an, a unique role in the lepton collider landscape. If physics wants us to go to a 2TV, 3TV, E plus E minus collider, we've done the R&D to, to be able to build that machine. So you've seen this drawing since several years. There's a, a drive beam that delivers the power to the RF structures and that accelerates the main beam. It's no longer just a drawing. This is a real prototype of a, of a click module at CERN. Uh, it's not cabled up, not connected in this picture, but uh, that has been done since then too. So to, before we start, I'll go through the history a bit. It, it's a long history already. So there was some modest Acceler R&D already in the 80s. Uh, it got strengthened quite strongly early 2000s uh, with uh, building of the CTF3 test facility, for instance. Uh, detector and physics studies were restarted, revitalized in 2008 in close collaboration with the ILC and there is now an umbrella organization called the LCC that covers both projects. Um, there's a, a strong synergy between these two linear collider projects in the sense that the detector studies are all based on ILC detector concept as a starting point. We know we can't use them out of the box, but we start from there and then uh, do the click specific improvements. <laughs> Conceptual design report was published in 2012. Uh, more or less formal click DP detector and physics collaboration was set up in the same year and click provided an input to the European strategy. So there's a lot of documents. Uh, they're sometimes a bit inaccessible maybe, but uh, a lot of what we've done is written up in these, these large volumes. The click collaboration separating by accelerator in red, detector in blue, or both in yellow. It, it is a global operation. It's strongly centered on, on the host lab at, at CERN, uh, but there are contributions to this detector and accelerator R&D from all over the globe. It's still growing. A few new institutes joined in uh, the last couple of years. And accelerator studies, I'm not going to cover all that's been done. I'm definitely not the person to cover that. But we, there are a lot of, there's a lot of hard work behind the conceptual design report. So we've built cavities. We've shown that they can get the 100 megavolts per meter that we need to get to 3 TeV with a reasonably compact machine. Uh, side studies have been done. Uh, energy consumption has been studied. So th there's a pretty complete set of studies behind uh, the machine proposal as it is today. This is a schedule that Steiner presented in September. Um, so we're in the development phase um, where a complete plan is set up. Then around 2018 or 19, based on what we know about physics at that time, uh, decisions should be taken and then you can go into preparation phase, construction start, and finally data taking. So that's all I'm going to say about machine. Let, let's go to detector and physics. So it, it is relatively lightweight still. There's 25 institutes and there is a, a loose collaboration structure. Um, the physics program, uh, we know 
these particles exist and we can build a guaranteed program based on those. So we can do precision measurements of these Ws, Xs and tops at a range of energies. So uh, we'll cover Higgs production, TT bar production uh, in, in this whole range. So we have a lot of access to, to different kinematic regimes within the machine. We envisage a, a low energy phase at 300 and something GeV, and then we'll go up as quickly as we can to the, to the high energy phase. The superior energy reach with respect to other projects gives Click some unique possibilities already here. The Higgs self-coupling can probably be better done at Click than at the other E plus E minus collider that are proposed. Top quark, uh, new physics effects on top quark production, vector boson physics. We've seen some of this in, in presentations already this week. But the main driver for building Click would be that there is a hint of new physics the wish to reach as high as possible energy in an E plus E minus machine because there is something that, that has a threshold at a TV or two TV and then click gives us the possibility to study it in detail. So the tentative program, as I said, we start at 300 and something GeV. 380 GeV is the number since, since last week. Uh, 1.4 TeV in the second phase and then three TeV ultimately. Luminosity ramps up quickly. There's a total curve and a 1% around the, the nominal energy in the peak. And then we can do, importantly, the Higgs trialing process, vector boson fusion. Uh, we know we need to get these two processes and that's what, what, what has singled out this region at around 380 GeV where you can access both processes get the total cross-section, get the total width, and then normalize all the couplings and branching ratios. If you go up to higher energy still, you get TT bar Higgs that opens up at about 500, 550 uh, Higgs pair production, quartic couplings, so we can access all these at, at the higher energies. The crucial measurement at 350 for, for Higgs physics is uh, Higgs stralung recoil mass reconstruction. So that's where a lot of the detector design drivers come from to get this peak as narrow as it is on this picture. We really need a very good tracker. Um, this has been how this has always been presented. More recently, we're looking into QQ bar final states for the Z boson. We can still reconstruct the recall mass quite, quite precisely if we build an excellent calorimeter. Uh, and that can give, give us quite an edge. If you go down from just the lepton decays, it, we get a precision on the Higgs to ZZ of 2.8%, 2.1%. If we add Z to QQ bar, we can reduce this by quite a bit. That's just a branching fraction. It is a bit more challenging to do that. It's not as elegant as the muon reconstruction. It's essentially independent of what happens in the rest of the event. But we think we can control this. And then the statistics uh, really gives us an improvement there. If we look at click several phases and what, what it brings, we see that we can get very precise couplings of the Higgs boson to standard model particles already at 350 GeV, but we still gain quite substantially by, by running the, these high energy phases. So at 1.4 and 3 TeV, the error bars on most couplings shrink by, by quite a large factor. This is the table as of last week. I won't go through the details. Top physics, we tend to forget, that, but the top is important too. Um, so one of the things we don't know is, can we do top quark physics below the pair production threshold, something we should investigate. There is single top production there, we should take advantage of it. Um, we know the top quark mass is probably best measured at threshold. We need very little integrated luminosity to get a very precise and well understood mass out of that. Uh, 
we get new physics constraints from measuring top production, top pair production, cross section, forward backward asymmetry, the left right asymmetry. They all give us uh, a very tight constraint on new physics and top in association with Higgs again at 550, which is roughly a threshold. And we think we can do this quite well up to about 1.4 TeV. So the complementarity with, with other lepton collider prospects is, is best summarized with this plot, I think. Right? If we want a 90 GeV collider, we wouldn't build it linear. If you want a 3 TeV collider, you wouldn't make a ring. Uh, and somewhere in between is the area where none of us is doing very well. So I think by combining uh, the, the potential of a circular machine here and the linear machine there, <coughs> one, one could get a very uh, good program, but then we're of course pro proposing two colliders rather than one, and it's hard enough to get one. So some of the synergies. Um, software, Tisa's already mentioned it, it's, it's, it's where most of the synergy between ILC and Click is happening, and I think we could extend this to, to circular machines quite, quite easily. And there are a lot of tools. Tisa has mentioned DD4 HAP, so I won't mention that again. There's even pure computing. There's an ILC Dirac that's used by Click too. Um, but the higher level algorithms have, have not received as much attention, maybe. So we know jet reconstruction is crucial, but we haven't really thought about lepton collider jet. So I'll go in a bit more detail about that. We have flavor tagging algorithms that have been maintained and developed further by, by ILC and CLIC. Particle flow, as you've heard from Tease, is crucial, and Pandora is used by both CLIC and the ILC. It's, it's a good starting point for, for studies like this. Uh, track reconstruction is very hard to get right on the full simulation, and it's an important limitation to what you can study in terms of detector performance. So a few specific issues from Click. The background is quite a bit more substantial than, than at the ILC. We don't know numbers about for the circular machines yet, uh, but likely Click is, is where this is the most challenging option. Um, particularly at 3 TeV, this would be a top quark pair without any overlaid backgrounds, and this is when we add gamma gamma to hadrons. So that's our pileup, if you want to talk about it in LHC terms. So th this can be quite substantial. It gives several TeV in the detector, and the click branch trains are very short. So to distinguish one branch crossing from the next, we need nanosecond or half a nanosecond time stamping of, of all the energy deposits. That's, of course, very challenging. 90% of this is in the forward system. It can be reduced to about order 100 GeV by applying a set of timing cuts. But still, it, it has a non-negligible impact on everything we do with jets after that. So this is, the black line is no background at all. And then I inject quite large numbers of, of background events on top of the the physics process. I use a Hadron Collider algorithm already to limit the impact, but still the energy and the mass of the W boson that I reconstruct in each of these cases is, is significantly degraded. There are some attempts, one of this is mine, to reduce the impact by looking at jet reconstruction again. So a lot of the studies use longitudinally invariant KT because it has a shrinking footprint, a shrinking catchment area as you move into the forward region. You can introduce this feature also in jet algorithms that have an E plus E minus style distance and that's what we call VLC. And there are a couple of parameters in this algorithm that allow you to reproduce the traditional E plus E minus algorithms for choices of gamma equal to zero. And you get Valencia, which is very close to longitudinally invariant KT in terms of robustness against background. And you can make all these different combinations. So we think those, those can gain quite a bit of performance that we've lost when we added all this gamma gamma to a background 
This would be the mass of a jet when it contains a complete hadronic top decay. So you would expect a, a sharp peak at the top mass with some tail going out. Durham, so good old Durham, does pretty lousy in this, in this situation. Longitudinal invariant KT that was established a couple of years ago already does a lot better. And this new algorithm with some tuning of the two parameters can, can do significantly better still. So I, I think right, it, it's, it's not an area where a lot of effort is going on, but it, it is important. Detector design synergy then. Um, you've heard from Thies that we've set pretty demanding requirements on this detector, and these are pretty similar for ILC and CLICK. This one, the, the vertex detector resolution, we've backed off slightly because it clicked at background levels, forces us to move the detector out by nearly a factor two, so it's hard enough to maintain this performance. Uh, the energy resolution for jets, we want to be as close to 3.5% as possible on the relative energy resolution. Um, and the tracker, we've mentioned this, 2 times 10 to the minus 5 is, is significantly better than the LHC experiments, for instance. And that is driven by several requirements and points for some, some new particles we might see. Higgs to mu mu is click specific. But the Higgs recall mass is probably the the strongest argument. If that peak gets broader, we need more luminosity to get the same uh, precision on the coupling. So it is very important in experiments that are limited by statistical errors it, uh, quite often that this resolution is as good as we can. And there are some specific requirements from the click beam structure. Um, right. To the main driver for the Jet reconstruction is we want to distinguish hadronic W's and Z's. And with the full simulation, we expect this kind of separation between the two, which is quite impressive. But you see, if we lose a bit on this, we'll immediately lose uh, distinguishing power between the two. An additional uh, requirement at click is that we maintain very good jet performance with very high jet multiplicities, where at the Z-pole, two jets was, was already uh, a large number. It can go up all the way to eight jets at, at click high energy runs. And the linear collider detector concepts, TIS has introduced them. Uh, we have high fields, highly granular granularometers, low mass tracking system that uses state of the art to get that precision vertexing. So as I said, initially these were the same. Um, and it's important that we don't just design these things on paper, I believe. It is important that we stay connected to test beams of prototypes, that we learn what limitations realistic systems have. And there have been test beams. These are data with a, a bit of an ECAL, a bit of an HCAL. Both are ultra granular and then a tail catcher to get the last of the 40 GVs. Um, so there's a, a cubic meter colorimeter prototype that has run in a beam. And that, that gives us some confidence that what we simulate has some relation to reality. Particle flow, I know you, some of you have been very involved in introducing this in CMS, for instance, so I won't go into detail. The basic idea is that rather than summing the electromagnetic and the hadronic energies of measured by two different subsystems. We try to follow each particle from the cradle to the grave, if you wish. And then you can use the tracker information for 60% of the energy, and you only need the hadron colorimeter to fill in the last 10%. Right. A lot of studies have been done, and I think we've learned a lot about the limitations and how it behaves at different energies. So typically you get curves like these, and you can bring them down into terms that come from imperfect clustering. Uh, so if you do perfect pattern recognition, you come down from the black line to the blue line, for instance. So 
we, we can map out where this works very well and where it tends to fail and see if we can optimize the detector further to, to get the best out of it. We've discussed the overall size and magnetic field briefly this morning. And there are many considerations that go into them. Of course, the tracker performance at high energy, we know how that scales, so we need a large field and a large lever arm to get the precise track resolution. The magnetic field um, has many more drivers. Uh, the beam straddling background at the ILC and click is important, and we want a large field to contain the beam straddling background uh, in the beam pipe as much as possible. From the particle flow studies that have been done, and these are from, from last week, um, the inner radius has a mild impact. So as you make the detector larger, you give the jets more time to open up, and that helps performance a bit at, at, at the highest energies. Uh, but it's not a very steep gradient. The B field, the same is true. Of course, this spreads out only the charged particles. We see improvement, especially at high energy, by making larger detectors with larger field. But it's not a very steep gradient. As Thies has shown, granular is key for these detectors. But you can note on these plots that 45 GeV jets, and those are very important, of course, for the the lower energy runs of, an, of a circular collider, the performance is quite a bit worse than we would have at 100 or 180 GeV. So there's a, a threat at high energy that uh, confusion takes over, but the, the resolution is really limited also at, at low energies. Yeah. As you just pointed out, I mean, only 10% of the measurement of the energy is measured in HCal4 jet, basically. So it seems like a large effect. Is this all confusion when you perform particle flow then? Well, this is the, the ECAL segmentation. No, I'm, I'm, I'm looking, looking at, at the HCal cell size here. Okay. Um, yeah, of course merging or splitting or, or assigning the energy in the wrong way can give you a large effect. And we're talking about 3% of a 45 GeV jet. That's a 1 GeV error gives you that, 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 that kind of mistake. So it, 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 we, we do always find that, that HCL cell size is key. You, you can't make it the, the size that you would traditionally have. But if you want to think of it in terms of Moliere radius and interaction length, we are instrumenting well below that level and we're still gaining with, with the particle flow. I think that that is one of the things that has always come out of these studies. Okay, so there's a a large number of, of parameters in the detector, of course, that we can vary. Uh, Click has tentatively selected small ECAL cells, 5 by 5 millimeter, uh, millimeter squared, a number of layers that's, that, that's large compared to existing systems, but it's moderate, modest in, in terms of what we're used to. Um, I did, I don't think any of this applies directly to a circular collider. You'd, you'd have to repeat these studies with your requirements and with your limitations in mind. But, but a lot of work exists, and it's useful to, to go through the literature before embarking on an optimization. So compared to the ILC, if I want to summarize everything, we started from ILC detector concepts. Um, including the whole suite of software that, that lives around the detector concept. Uh, we have adapted things. We need a deeper calorimeter. That's pretty obvious, but we've been able to give a quantitative answer to that question. 
the tracker pattern recognition is more important at high energy than it is at, at, at 45 GV jets. So Click has decided to prefer silicon over the TPC. Uh, right now it wants to run with just a single detector concept just to make sure we get the best out of the resources. Um, as energy goes up, we need to worry even more about coverage down to the smallest polar angle. A lot of T-channels become abundant and might become quite relevant for the physics program. So we need to make sure we catch everything we can down to the lowest angle. Uh, performance in forward regions tends to drop with respect to the central detector. We have to keep that degradation as small as possible. Background levels force us to timestamp particles, and that means we get fast readouts, about 10 nanoseconds for the silicon tracking and vertexing systems, and even one nanosecond for the, for the calorimeter. So these are really click-specific requirements. So detector R&D, Tisa's already mentioned some of this. But it is important, I think, that we really try to build prototypes for all of the things we claim we can do. Uh, Click DNP, the Detector and Physics Group, joined Kali's and FCAL to, to join in the development of ultra-granular forward calorimeter. This is an example of a tungsten stack at CERN instrumented with the semi-digital HCAL readout. And these are the, the test beams of, of hadronic showers in those structures. For vertexing, the click take is that, that we can do, we have all the same requirements that the ILC have, plus a few more. Essentially, we want to get as close to single bunch time stamping as we can. Half a nanosecond at click is, is really very challenging. So the requirement that we've set up is 10 nanoseconds, but even that, in conjunction with the thin, uh, Right, with the material budget that we've defined, with the resolution we want, that, that is really quite challenging. So there are two approaches. Click picks is an evolution of the Medipix, VeloPix, uh, hybrid pixel detectors. It's an attempt to take an existing technology to a material budget. That, that is quite challenging. So we're thinning silicon down to 50 micron, 100 micron, wherever we can, we're taking out as much material as possible. Another line that's being investigated is HVC MOS that has some interest also for, for the LHC upgrades, and that's a, a technology that the Click uh, group has jumped on. So to summarize things, um, we have a mature concept for a multi-TEV collider, mature meaning conceptual design report level. We're not at the fully engineered level yet, but we hope to get there in the next years. Uh, it has a comprehensive physics program, which has the precision measurements of the known particles, but can also get us to 1.4 and 3 TEV if new physics tells us we need it. Uh, lepton colliders do have a lot of issues in common. So I think it would be worthwhile to study the potential of given measurement as a function of square root of s. And it's easy enough to, to plug in luminosity measure numbers for, for different machines. Rather than repeating the same studies over and over again with different assumptions every time. Um, we could collaborate in a useful way in the high level reconstruction, I believe, particle flow, jet reconstruction, that kind of things. Detector design, uh, I think we've done, together with the ILC, a lot to prove that the particle flow detector concept with a realistic detector design can, can give us the performance that we need. And as it is, a flexible toolkit for the detector description and the reconstruction software on top of that exists now, so it's right there for you to use. And detector R&D, I think the, the spare points are ultra-granular particle flow and ultra-transparent silicon for vertexing and tracking. Those are the areas where Click is most active. Thank you. Thank you, Marcel.
Questions? Now, just one comment. I think one of the main reasons why Click chose silicon tracking over TPC has to do with the time structure of the Click, which is, is not very uh, nice to a TPC. Right. I think our um, our time structure is going to be bunch train, bunch crossing rates at the which could go down to even five nanoseconds at the Z peak. Of course, they go higher, longer distance at the top, but they certainly are quite fast. Uh, I think we get an event every every five hundred bunch crossings, which is only every microsecond, so that's probably also not very good for TPC at the Z peak, I assume. Um, but let me come to another question for you and for Tis maybe. How how in practice do you see a possible collaboration? Maybe it's something we should take offline, but um, I'd like to bring that um, Right, there is an additional complication, which is, of course, you, you're in a package with a Hadron Collider, which, which has a very different detector design, I would suspect. But, but right, as, as we've both indicated, let's, there let's, is... Let's concentrate on the lepton machines, just for now. Right. It's it, even probable that there will be different uh, caverns for the lepton machine and Hadron machine detectors. But, but in terms of, right, it, it, it is a lot of effort to set up a, a complete detector design, to put it all in Gion4, to get reconstruction software. And I think Click is probably an example of, of a pragmatic approach to this problem. Something existed, we, didn't, we know it wasn't perfect for what we wanted to do, but it was a lot, a lot better than starting from scratch. And so they just started from ILC detector concepts, ILC software, and started evolving it from there. Um, I think that would be a sensible approach also for, for a circular machine. I would, I would agree that also on, on software side, there are very clear points where one could connect if one wanted to. Um, but I would also add that uh, I think also the area of R&D is something where I think many of the problems are actually common, of the more technological challenges, for example, in granular calorimetry or in silicon tracking or in vertexing. And one could definitely, I think, envision to collaborate them more closely, even if in the end, because of the different uh, situations, ILC, CLIC, and, and FCC do choose different baselines, which is fine. Still, the problem as such is the same. I, I don't know if there is a plan for an FCC-specific detector R&D program. Right? It's a question of resources. And Not yet. There's many activities going on for FCC R&D. By example, in Saclay, we're looking at the TPC and particularly concentrating on the ion bike flow uh, because which this is an issue at FCC. Uh, but there is no, I would say, uh, comprehensive plan, and that's what we need to set up. Uh, just to comment, the uh, TPC is difficult in the in the in the environment of uh, FCC, obviously because of the of the continuous machine, but and that's particularly at the Z. But at the Z, this is particularly precisely the point where the track are the softers, and you can, using silicon is a problem also <laughs> because you got a lot of material with low momentum particles. So there's no ideal. At, at least for the moment, I don't see any ideal solution. Uh, so there will be compromise. I 
Are there other questions? Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Marcel.